lies one day at a time. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. They're here to get your day going fine. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elations Radio. And here's your host, Miss Kim. Are you looking for an above average talk show that tackles kingdom issues and current events? Then join Elder Ernest E. Richard Jr. and the panel of the Pastor's Corner podcast every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. Central. It's a show that tackles those issues that attack your day. It's the Pastor's Corner radio podcast here on Elations Radio. That's real talk for real people with real purpose. Thank you. 
Welcome to Making Marriage Meaningful. This is your host, Apostle Irvin Whitlow. And the Lord bless you. We say welcome tonight to Making Marriage Here we are in anticipation that God is going to do some great things, share some great things with us. We had such a great time last week, amen, on this podcast, but I'm glad that you are back tonight. Now, I must uh, submit this disclaimer to you that I am not a relationship expert. I just share the things that God has shared with me to be a help to you, hoping that you will take something that is said and make use of it. Same time, I put this other disclaimer out there uh, that this conversation is real, it's raw. I mean, real raw. But it's right because we're going to talk real talk here. We're going to say things that the church is afraid to say, especially from the pulpit. But God gave us this platform that we can do just that. So I want you to tune in. I want you to listen. I want to welcome your comments or your questions, or I even invite you, if you would like to share with us, to call in at 646-564-9842. I've got it there. We're on social media on the Making Marriage Meaningful page. So we're excited about that. We're excited about being on Elation Radio. We're excited about being on other platforms. We are just grateful that God is doing all of this good stuff. Now, here's the thing. I don't do it all by myself. Nah, I won't even dare try to take that credit because if I did, I'd be lying, and I refuse to be a liar, okay? I've got some folk who can help me out very well. I want to go over to St. Louis, Missouri, to the producer of our show, my good friend, my beloved sister whom I love dearly. That is Dr. Kimmy Kim. Are you with us tonight, my sister? I am, my brother. This is a great day. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you so much. Amen. I want to shoot from the mid over to the coast just a little bit. Get over to Upper Marlboro, Maryland. I don't know if he's with us tonight. I'm hoping he is. He's been on the road traveling. But I'm talking about my big brother from another mother who is over there pastoring Power to Stand Outreach Ministries. He's my friend, and I love him dearly. I'm talking about the one, the only elder, Ernest E. Richard Jr. Please tell me you're with me, my brother. So that means he's still on the road. Okay, so let's go on up a little bit further north. I've got my great sister who takes care of my hair and makes sure I look pretty decent when I get on this podcast. That is up in Newark, New Jersey. I'm talking about the one, the only G. Johnson. I know you here, right? Hey, man, praise God. I am here tonight. How is everyone doing? Good, good. good. Uh, you know, good, good, good. And we're going to look for our other brother, the one who is the preacher of preachers, the teacher of teachers. He has, he should have his own university, the truth be told. Amen. He's a great pastor of Morning Star Church, and he's the presider of volume of the book, Deliverance Ministry International Incorporated. Amen. Again, another brother from another mother. I'm talking about Apostle Vincent L. Smith. Are you with me, sir? Yet no worry about a thing. Every little thing is going to be all right. Oh, bless you, man. Bless you. Ready to get it going. Amen. Amen. So happy to have you. Amen. And, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful and grateful some more. I believe that I heard that we were going to have a guest tonight uh, in the person of uh, Prophet Kim Peoples. Are you here, my beloved? All right. Just thought I would check. Just make sure, make one more check over in Huntsville, Alabama, to Pastor Belinda Wilkerson. Are you here tonight? All right. Just wanted to do my round-the-way check. You know, sometimes you don't check, and then you find out people were there, and then they get mad. Well, you didn't call me, bro. 
Let me make this one more thing, one more appeal. If you're online, you want to introduce yourself and let us know that you're here, please do so now because we'd like to know who you are. Going once, going twice, or three times would be too much, all right? So, listen, we're going to get ready to get going. <laughs> amen. Listen, amen. Uh, G. Johnson, won't you lead us in a word of prayer tonight before we get started? Amen. Okay. Father, we come before you this evening with thanksgiving in our hearts and souls. We thank you for another evening uh, to do the works that you have called us to do. So, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come together once more and again on this glorious Thursday night to share and profess the word among your people and the body of Christ. Father God, we give you all the honor and all the glory and all the praise because you are worthy to be praised. Father, we ask that you will open up our hearts and spirits to receive the word. Let us decrease while you increase, Father. We thank you so much for this time of coming together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Listen, let me read the scripture to you, and then uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Bible says in Genesis 2, 18, reading out of the New Living Translation, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, and all the birds of the sky, he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, to all the birds of the sky, and to all the wild beasts, uh, all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep while the man slept. The Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is one, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother, and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Again, we've been talking about matching God's meaning, and we have been in this series of the relationship chair. We have established the foundation, which is connected. We have defined the four legs of the chair, which is friendship, fellowship, the family, finances. And we have reached the seat of the chair, which is called faith. We have come to the conclusion that this faith that is in or on part of this chair is what supports the weight of the marriage. Again, our Apostle Smith about a month ago said that this faith is defined as confidence, the willingness to place this marriage in the hands of God. That's why we, uh, we, we say what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, because you give it to God, he puts a seal on it to say, this is now my doing to me. However, marriages go through things. Point blank, period. Every relationship goes through things. Some things are tedious. Some things are tragic. Some things are triumphant. But marriages go through things. And so this faith in marriage is what supports the weight of the marriage. And so in this of the supporting of the weight, we have come to the conclusion that marriages will experience challenges. Okay, but if you are built on the same foundation of faith and principles, you can get past it. Then there are challenges. Uh, You know, after challenges, you have to understand there is also this other thing called comparisons. 
when you are feeling like uh, you're supposed to be like somebody else and not who you were meant to be, who you were created to be, or who you were designed to be. But last week, we embarked upon another phase of, 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 of challenges, which is called control in marriage. And as we begin to talk about control in marriage, we begin to talk about the difference between uh, being dominated and coming to some agreement for mutual submission. We, we talked on that rise about that. And so even as we begin talking about isolation, one of the things that came up is how the, the church is the bride of Christ and how pastors have, if you will, mishandled the bride of Christ or sought to control the bride of Christ, uh, which is we've come to the conclusion out of order, trying to tell the bride of Christ what they can and cannot do, what can take place and what cannot take place. That has become the issue. Now, the reason we bring up the bride of Christ, because everything about Christ is a typology for us even here and now. The things that we saw in the Old Testament, the things that we see in the New Testament, all of it relates to something for us here and now. And so the way to succeed, the way to uh, advance, the way to see good results is we have to pattern ourselves, our relationships, specifically our marriage, after the Lord. So, that man is supposed to love his wife, wife is to submit to the husband, but it does not mean that the man is the boss. No, it means that they come to a mutual understanding with him being the one who takes the responsibility of the decision that has been made for the purpose of the mission. Remember, God said it ain't good for the man to be alone, so he had to find someone who was suitable to help him. Why? Because there are things that he must carry out, and he cannot do it on his own. Nobody can do it alone, point blank, period. You might have been trying to, you might desire to, because you may not want to be bothered, but that is not what God designed. God designed a togetherness, a togetherness, a connection, a relationship. And so really, many relationships, they fall apart because you have one trying to control the other. And if you have that in a relationship, specifically a marriage, you're going to hit rock bottom quick, fast, and in a hurry because ain't no man going to be dominated by no woman and ain't no woman going to be dominated by no man. But we have to follow with the order of God. The Bible says that I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So if there is a heavenly order, then there must be an earthly order. Mm -hmm. And if God gives instructions to Christ and Christ gives instructions to the man, then man must be able to give instructions to his wife. And the Bible says that even if your man does not obey the word of God, they may also, without the word of God, be won by the manner of the conversation. That is how you conduct yourself as a woman. So it, it is not about being dominated. Please hear me. It is not about being dominated. It is about learning how to be in proper order with God and with this plan. I have said this over and over again. If we're talking about matching his meaning, then our desire must match his design. Our setup must, must, must match what God has established, point blank. Period. So we talked last week in control in marriage, and one of the first things that we noticed is isolation, who you can be around, who you can't be around, who you can go around, who you cannot go around. You don't want to be, you're trying to keep people from family members, trying to keep them from loved ones and things like that, and that is out of order. The another thing that is an area of control in marriage is chronic criticism, meaning that you criticize everything trying to make someone feel like they are not good enough to do anything good. Uh, uh, Apostle Smith, what do you think about that chronic criticism, always trying to make a person feel like they're not good enough to do what they do? Well, uh, chronic criticism is really uh, 
I call it I call it the public way out. Really a person that is always uh, picking at you in, in a controlling way about what's wrong with you and what you need to fix and you so fat now and you know and you you this and you that they're really insecure about themselves. Yeah. But the only one they feel that they can pick on and control is their mate. Other than that, they wouldn't have nothing to say. Okay. Okay. G. Johnson? Uh, well, just to piggyback on what he was saying, you know, uh, they're the only ones that are are there to pick on. Um, so they choose that person to um, do what they do with them. Because uh, sometimes people are drawing attention away from themselves. So, you know, don't don't look at what I'm doing and all this these things. So uh, let me draw attention on you to take attention off of me. So, you know, that, that could be. But apparently it is uh, an insecurity somewhere. Amen. Okay. Amen. Uh, Tim, talk to me about that. Yes. What was the question? I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, chronic criticism. Someone always criticizing their mate in the marriage as a form of control. Chronic criticism. Well, from my personal experience when you have someone that is always criticizing you, they have issues because what it is, mm-hmm. they feel insecure, so they're looking for someone to put down so they can feel better than that person. So when you're not secure and when you have a mate, you you try to put them down so that you can look better. But really, it's the person who is abusing the person to... Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, we hear you. It's a little noise, okay. but I'm, I can hear. You. I think it's someone's phone, Amen. but yeah, I in my experience, I really believe it's a person who was abuser. Uh, so let me ask this question: Could it be that insecurity? is the initiator of control? Anyone answer that? Mm. Mm. Yes. Personal experience? Mm. Yes. It is. Do you you know why? Why? Because when that person um, uses that, um, um, well, it's really addiction, but when they use that as a control, it's because they probably have issues in the past that they haven't addressed, and so they carry their baggage onto mm-hmm. the relationship. There you go. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I I agree. I agree. So. Okay. 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 So so you got people who deal with this criticism, you know. You 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 need to cook better. Your cooking is terrible. You, you your your job doesn't bring in enough money. You ain't doing nothing to me. Your your job don't do nothing. You ain't proving nothing to me, or or something else. You don't hold me right. I can't stand the way you dress. Can't stand the way all these things because of what an insecurity. All these things for an insecurity just to what? Try to control a marriage. And what I've discovered that they go from isolation to chronic criticism, but what I've discovered is it leads to overt threats. And now, this is what bothers me, right? An overt threat is or from the aspect is I'm going to take my stuff and I'm going to leave. Oh, and you can't make it without me because you need me. Somebody talk to me about really? that. Really? Wow. When somebody talking about, oh, I, I'll leave. 
I take this, I take that, and you have to deal with this, you have to deal with that. Like for instance, let me give you a typical example. You, you know, let's say let's say a man is uh, is married to a decent woman, and he finds himself in a little bit of trouble with the law, and so he, he gets a little bit of uh, he gets a little slap on the wrist for you know maybe like a misdemeanor, and all of a sudden, you know, he has to now he has a probation period, and he has to go to a probation officer. Then a disagreement comes up in the the marriage, right? And then she says, "Oh, I dare you to do something." Because I'll, I'll call mm. the police, knowing that it will uh, provoke some other things. Knowing right. that, you know, there's a that's already going on. That, you know, so that's what I mean when I talk about an overt threat. When you, yeah, I'll call the police on you. Uh, and I'll take what I brought in here and leave you with nothing. I'll take your kids from you. And I'll take you to court. And I get all the money. Talk to me on that wise. Somebody. Wow. 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 Uh, we got that. The best thing. Go ahead. <laughs> when, when, when a person does that, they're really, uh, they're really trying to, as, as it were, use what they have as an advantage to the checker game. Mm. And, and mm. They're, they're trying to they're trying to manipulate in a way that you feel subject to them that you you if you don't do what I say and if you don't do it the way I want it done now I have this chip I have this bargaining chip I have this magic wand now that's in my hand that, that if you don't do it my way then I'm going to use what I got against you. And really it, at that point it goes beyond even control. Now it becomes abusive because that is that is that mind that is mind abuse. Okay. But where you where you ride a person about a mistake in their life that could send them to jail or uh, 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 they always get to check in with their counselor or whatever, and you're constantly mm. throwing that thing in their face. That becomes abuse. And you go on the Okay. Okay. What? So, what? so what? abuse. Is a part. So, come on, talk to me, G. Johnson. Um. Well, you know uh, what he was saying. That's that's uh, very true. But if you find that someone is uh, the first time when someone does that, uh, I think you need to nip it in the bud. Uh, right then and there, because it's not going to stop, um, and and that is a potentially dangerous person, uh, because you could get in a lot of trouble if someone is threatening, especially the law, and what's going on right now. And if you even see that that um, that if that happens the first time, uh, me personally, I, it won't happen again. Um, because that person's not gonna they're not gonna stop. They're gonna use that weapon every time they wanna get their way and and you're constantly living in what? Uh some type of fear of this person. So you have to get that that straightened out some some way or another. Me personally I would run. Okay. Okay. So so Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't allow it to, to keep happening. Mm-hmm. Could it be that that individual is tr- really trying to get rid of you? Uh, could that be the case? That's why they do it? No, I don't think so. I think it's just a control issue. Hmm. Okay. So that's it's perfect. more like a thing that you have to It's more like you have a dependence thing. You need me. You have to depend on me. It's more like that. 
Yeah, uh, that's the way that they they uh, like to stay in control or get their way. Or if they feel like they can get away with it, it's going to constantly happen. So if you know, if you just take it, and uh, then that's I'm saying that's your fault. So you know. Wow. That's wow. Just my so if you stay there and take it. So if you stay there and take it, it's your fault because you see it. But you're not doing anything. Because you already seen it. Right, exactly. Exactly. That's just my opinion. Well, Apostle Smith, let me turn to you. Do we see something like this that happens in the body of Christ? Mm hmm. Sure do. Oh, Overseer Richard, you made it. Thank God for you. Yeah, well, I had to take a nap. I'm still driving, but hey, this will help me get home. <laughs> so, so talk to me about how this happens in the body of Christ. Now, I got to get the fullness of the question before I can give an answer. What is the fullness of the question or the challenge? Uh, what's on? Uh, we're talking about overt threat. Uh, overt threat that uh, I'm going. I'll do this. Uh, you know, just basically as a way to. Uh, keep control. So if you don't do well, what I want, then don't do this. Listen, you've you so got multiples. There are multiples in that respect. All right, here's the first one. Let's do a husband and wife multiple, okay? First, somebody's phone is breaking up really, really bad. I mean, really bad. Um, um, Basically, what you're looking at is with a husband and wife, a husband has to, you know, those jealous husbands who have to be the shining star, afraid to allow his spouse to have the spotlight, will abuse her verbally, assassinate her character, tear her down, and eventually start putting his hands on her in an attempt to whoop her behind just to cause her to subdue or be submitted to him. Now, there is another element to that because, on the other hand, a wife who is aware of a husband's secret, i.e., he might be on the DL, for instance, and they have a large congregation, and she's threatening either do what she tells him to do or she's going to expose him to the congregation. Okay? So there's a duel there. Let's go out a little further. The pastor, overseer, bishop, uh, whatever you want to call him, has a mistress, sick and tired of being second rate, and is threatening. And these are all forms of control. It's threatening to literally destroy his marriage and his relationship unless she gets what she's looking for, and vice versa for the wife to uh, another man. So you've got various forms of control right there in the midst already. The thing to do is not to put yourself in that position because when you put yourself in that position, whatever the consequences are, remember, you created them. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's like making a deal with the devil. That's like making a deal with the devil, and you tell the devil, if you uh, make me filthy, rich, and famous, I'll come serve you. And the devil says, oh, you better do it or else. And then you try to renege on it and run away from it. Next thing you know, your life is in extreme turmoil. Some things are not are not meant to be played with. That's true. Okay. Okay. So, so Apostle Smith, tell me, how does this happen in church? With these overt threats. Well, uh, let let me let me just run through the church for a minute. Sometimes it, you can have a choir director that tells you, well, if you don't want to sing it the way I'm directing it, then you know this this that and the other. Well, director, you might be off that night. Mm-hmm. You you're not the only one noticed all. You know, 
and then you have wow. pastors. <laughs> and then you, then you have pastors who make it sound like you you won't be elevated, you won't move in the church to any other responsibility if you don't do it that way. If you if you don't follow that lead in all of this, my my thing is uh, control control in the church has been now as a in the Huh? No, I'm trying to get past this, this whatever. Okay. Okay. So apparently, Con- con- oh, control okay. in the church now. Control in the church now is now called. Oh, uh, 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 they 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 have covered it up with you supposed to obey the pastor. Apostle, if I could throw this out there, it's called blackmail. Mm. Or is it called blackmail? It's called blackmail. But mm. what? But but what? If you if you if you really want to know what's happening nowadays, it's now called church mafia. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, true too. Church mafia. Okay. It's called church mafia. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. What that means is your career will sleep with the fishes. Hmm. <laughs> so, so, so does it just work? Now here's the question: Does it just work with the pastor to the congregation, or does the congregation do it to the pastor? Both. Oh yeah, that that happens in both ways. Hmm. It happens both ways because I remember. Especially in especially in these churches where the pastor is quote in quote higher higher than the pastor. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I, I know I know of a man who's um he started ministering at a local assembly and he started changing certain things the way he felt to change. He said one of the members who had been there forever says, I put the organ in the church. And if you do something else without my permission, I'm going to take my organ out the church. So the minister, mm. that pastor, was somewhat bothered. He was somewhat bothered. But, you know, he kept ministering, kept preaching and trying to be as kind as he could be. Then he allowed, he had some um he started adding staff members to the church to do work in the church. Same person came up again and said, uh, you know, I done told you before. I'm gonna tell you again. Now, uh you keep doing stuff that I do not agree uh, with. I my organ and I'm going to leave out this church. So by this time the pastor had gotten to the place when he had grown the ministry from 45 people to about 500 people. So, you know, things are flowing a whole lot better. Now that this growth has come, this woman says, well, you know what, I don't have it with you. I'm about to go. I'm about to take my organ. I'm about to leave. The pastor told her, well, do, sweetheart, do what you have to do because the church has an account now. We can go buy one that the church will own. So, so it goes not only from the pastor to the congregation, but the congregation will try to do it to the pastor because of what they think that they bring to the table. Mm-hmm. You, you know you know what that is, Apostle? <laughs> What's that? That's a church with no training. That's a church. Okay. Because for that, for that person, that you would be talking like that, that I'm going to take my organ because I brought the organ. Well, you purchased the organ for the church. And once you put that organ in the church, it no longer belongs to you. You gifted it to the church. Mm. That's true. Well, so, so, 
man, let, let, let me throw this out. Here's where the pastor made the mistake. There should have been paperwork that says uh, that, that that organ has been purchased for use within the church. And if that individual uh, were to come back with that thing, you break that paperwork out. Take me to court because you're not moving the organ. End of story. <laughs> well, here's another thing. Here's another thing because you have people who bring their tithes and their offerings, they feel that they can dictate to the pastor what he can and cannot do. Apostle Smith talked about especially the pastors who are hired or, if you will, who are voted in. But, but yeah. there are pastors who are not voted in, but because people are, are, are bringing in their finances, they feel that they have a right to try to dictate to the pastor what should and shouldn't take place. Take place. For instance, this is, this is personal. When I was when my first pastoral assignment was in Bloomington, Indiana, I never forget. Um, and when I came there, first thing before I arrived, when the people heard that I was coming, the people cleaned out the bank account and they took all of the materials that belonged to the church. No problem. I came there and God had blessed me that I was able to bring materials that was necessary and to establish the account. Thanks to God for his doing that. Okay, but now, here we are. Now we're building people because we, we we're advertising. We got flyers out. People are checking us out. People are coming, you know. So we, we, we got a mixed congregation. I'm like, okay, Lord, do your thing. We got, you know, all kind of people coming in. Here we got this couple coming in, and they were Jewish people. Here's the thing that got me. When we were minister, worshiping in this particular facility, you know, they wanted to come and say, well, pastor, uh, we, we, we think that we don't need to have service here. We need to have service in my house because that's how they did it in the book of Acts. They went from house to house, and, you know, hmm. and I says, and, and, and I told them, and they, then they said they had the nerve to throw this part in. We pay, we pay the most money in the church. Mm. So y'all should come uh-huh. and service. And I I told them, I told them like this, I said, well, I'm grateful that you do pay what you pay. I said, but here's the thing. I said, you, you didn't pay for this ministry. And you weren't charged with this ministry. So therefore, this ministry doesn't go in the direction that you should go in. They called my pastor in Birmingham, Alabama. He's deceased now. But when he was alive, they called him and said, this man of God, he refuses to do things the way that we want uh, because we bring the most money to the church. My pastor told them, said, well, how dare you call me? He's your pastor. And if that's what he's saying, then you need to follow him. And don't ever call me again about what he's not doing because one thing you ain't going to do is you're not going to control him. So these are things that happen in today's time. Amen? You, you know what Apostle says? There's two words. There's two words that is mixed up in marriage. Two words are mixed up in church work, and that's submission and subject to, 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 be, to be subject. To submit and to be subject. And really, the scripture says that a wife should be submit to her husband, but it also says the husband ought to submit to his wife. Why? Because to submit is to come under the commission of God. That, that's why I always tell them when I'm getting ready to marry them, submit does not mean put your knee on somebody. You you got to put your thumb on them. You're going to hold them down with your foot. Submit only meant that the man and the woman understand the mission of God in the other one. And that's why I 
So going back again, let's try it again. So we talked about isolation. We talked about chronic criticism. We talked about overt threats. I want to look at conditional attraction, exception, and caring. In other words, how uh, some things are intentional. Uh, conditional attraction from the aspects of how you dress, but you do it on purpose to be a distraction, but yet you want acceptance and you want someone to care about you. For instance, you know we're going to a, a business meeting, or better yet, we're going to a particular function of the, of the job, right? And everyone is formal, but yet you show up telling just about everything. And then your words are, well, if you don't like me like this, well, then fine, I don't have to be here. But they know that they're supposed to be together. What do you think about that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, all right. Give me give me that scenario one more time, please. Let's say give me that go ahead. You you and your wife are going to a major function. Let's say this major function is with the governor. Let's just say. Yeah. Okay? All right. This is something very and you figure you figure to go to this you're you're looking at uh let's say twenty five hundred dollars a place. So you're spending five thousand dollars for your ticket, your wife's ticket to go to this function with the governor. Now very normal. You have on a tuxedo, but your wife shows up in so. And what? Speedo. You know what speedos are? Leotards. You know those 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 things that show everything. Well, I know. I heard you say speedos. I'm sure I say. Uh, uh, I'm from a part a, a part of town that you may not be familiar with. I wish a Negro would. <laughs> but I'm saying, but, but this is, but but she's doing this, right? To the, but because she wants her acceptance, right? And and it's a conditional type of attraction. <laughs> well, if you don't like me like this, I don't have to go. Knowing you don't spend this money, you can't get it back. Oh, guess what? Knowing is gonna. Bring Negative attention. Well, she ain't going with me. Not that day. They just got twenty five hundred dollars if we ain't get back. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry. She, ain't going she has to under that she she has to understand that she is a representation of God first and a representation of us as a family. And you will not embarrass our family like that. You will not bring ridicule and shame to our family or to the name on our family. You're not doing it. I'm sorry. Stay home. That's just we we just won't be used. That twenty five hundred dollars was just given away. Apostle, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna use it like this. Twice, okay. Twice, twice with a twice with a former wife. Jesus. We we went to somebody's church. <laughs> and my people, my people from the church was highly upset. The one church we went to, we knew that the first lady at that church had to say my ex-wife decided to go to church with a sweatshirt and a jean skirt on. And we were going to their house to their Then we went to New York one time, and she pulled the same mess. And so when we were getting off the bus, 
What the young lady said to her, oh, I'll take your clothes in for you. She said, what clothes? This is what I'm wearing. We went to a church mm. all the way in New York. She sits up in there with a sweatshirt and a jean shirt on. And all the rest of the things are dressed up. Okay. Now, who so, is this? This is it was it was the ex wife of mine. Oh, okay. And so, I got you. And so it's really it's so it, it, it really embarrassed the church. And it also was a letdown to me letdown that you think as a first lady you don't have the rest of it. And if anybody has to represent in a ministry, it's the family of the family. That's right. Okay. Even when you don't feel like it, you got to put them glad rags on and say, I'm going out here and represent my wife, represent my husband, and make them look good. And also make the ministry look good. Amen. Okay. Amen. Okay. There's a lot of that to think about. There's a lot about. But again, this is, you know, a form of control. Because you want this attention. You, you know, you want you want someone to uh, recognize you and accept you and care about you, but you do stuff like this continually on purpose. That's conditional attraction. Well, you, if I can't wear this, then you must not love me. If I can't wear this, then well, you think something is wrong with me. I would say because I love you, I'm not going to allow you to wear it. Because what I'm trying to make you do... I, I, I'm trying to not make you look stupid. That's all. I'm trying okay. to make sure you don't look stupid. I'm trying to make sure you don't look foolish in front of people. I'm trying. Now, let me tell. Let, 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 let's digress just for a minute. When David came back to uh, the city of David with the Ark of the Covenant and started dancing in the street, uh, uh, his wife, Michelle, uh, uh, Michelle, Michelle, whatever you want to call her, uh, spoke up and told him in so many words, you are embarrassing us with the way you're carrying on out there in the street. What I'm trying to say is uh, there is a time and a place for everything. And what that the scenario you just described is not the time. Neither is a place. For such a thing as that. Mm. Okay. Now, now, so, so, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Is trying to protect your mate the same as control? No. No. <laughs> it's responsibility. Why not? Somebody, why not? It's responsibility. It's not control. Hmm. Hmm. So it's a form of responsibility, not control. It is not control. It is a form of responsibility. It is your responsibility to represent yourself in the most honorable way. And if that woman is part of you, part of your family, part of your legacy, part of your life, she too has to conform to that particular standard. She doesn't have a choice. Now, she can bow out, step down, move out, and go on about her business. Now, I, I mean, you know, you can go through all that, but the truth of the matter is, no, you have a responsibility to cover her. And in covering her, you're responsible for making sure that she doesn't look foolish in the eyesight of men. And, and right, and the same vice versa, you know, because if, if I have lost my mind and I go out there with a miniskirt, I would hope that my husband would say, you know, 
you you know, are you feeling okay? Let me just, you know, snap you back into the place. So that's the responsibility on both parts. It, you know, sometimes people are having a bad day. They may have lost it. And so that's when you have to bring them back into reality. Okay. And even in the nation of, of Islam, that is part of that teaching when it comes to marriage. Love, respect, protect your wife. Okay. Amen. 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 That, that is, that is okay. their slogan when it comes to marriage. Well, I say your wife, they actually say the family. But it is love, protect, I mean love, respect, protect your wife. And so that is their constant teaching. That, that's not a, that's not a means of control. That should be a husband that can. Amen. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to I want to go a little further. When we talk more about control and marriage, I want to talk about an overactive scorecard. An overactive scorecard. By what I now what I mean by this is keeping record of everything you do. Keeping record. It takes wow. you 15 minutes to get home to work. And, it, and you and, it, and you come here uh, uh, at, at 18 minutes late. What was the problem? <laughs> uh, or, or why is it that? Why is it that you you're always hearing from your job? You know, it's after hours. What so can be so important? Um, you why is it, why is it that you always waking up early? Why are you going to do it? You want answers to that? Talk to me. I mean, look, I don't, the bottom line is, uh, I'm right here. I'm, I, I'm, the bottom line is, I mean, you know, she's so worried about my job contacting me. Maybe when I'm. You, hello? Where'd you go? Hello? He must have went in the bathroom. Uh, but that is not for the missus to challenge it because the first thing I say is simply this. Have you looked on your wrist? Have you looked around your neck? Have you checked your jewelry box, your clothes closet, your shoe closet, your coat closet? Uh, I can stop. It ain't no problem. But you're going to be selling some of that stuff you got. I promise you. But but when we talk about an overactive scorecard, I'm just using the job as an example. But when you yeah, when but you see, go to the store, when you go to the grocery store, why are you smiling at her? You must want her, don't you? Or um, it, you know, uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, Apostle, <laughs> Apostle, and both of you know that I've been down that road. I you know with hope. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Both of you. Know that I've been down that road, and you know, you, you know with whom. And the truth of the matter is, I can't do nothing about her insecurities if she's going to display them at the wrong time. Hmm. I can't do anything about her insecurities. That's not an overactive scorecard. That's an insecure individual, and she's looking for a fight. Why is she looking for a fight? Good question. I don't know why she's looking for a fight. But here's what I want you to look at. Here's what I want you to look at. It's an overactive scorecard because it's, it's, she's keeping a record of every single thing you say, every single thing you do. So you say that you're going to do this, and for whatever the reason, you didn't do it. So now she's, she's got this scorecard. Well, you didn't do this like you said you were going to do. Um, you you, you really, that we were going to vacation and we didn't you, go. You really so don't. You lied. 
you Hello? really you really don't know if there's a scorecard until you get to your argument. And you won't be arguing about today. You you won't be arguing about something that happened today. And then she reached like three months ago. And, Boy, and three start years bringing ago. it up and start bringing it up from three months ago. Yeah, that's a scorecard. Okay. But if, and the Bible and, and, and the set. Go ahead. If the conversation or the uh-huh. argument came came out of an issue that you're dealing with right now, that's not a scorecard. But a scorecard is when they want to reach back and, and yeah, that's just like I remember. Uh, I remember back in July. Uh, July, July, July. And you bring yourself up you you've been holding that that for Man. Sounds like they need counseling. 
But now, wait, let, let me say this. We're gonna, yeah, you're right. They do need counseling. But also, I want to say to the man, don't make a promise you have no intention to keep. Because she has a right to, to, to hold your feet to the fire. When you tell her you're going to do something and you don't do it. Hmm. Okay. That's all. So, I mean, she has a right. You know, so. You tell her. You tell her you're gonna paint the garage, uh, and three months later, the garage still ain't painted. And if she comes back to you saying you said you was gonna paint this garage, okay? Uh, you know your word is your bonds, fellas. You gotta move. You don't have a choice. You put yourself but, in the position. But but what if what if even after you said you're gonna paint the garage? Your schedule doesn't allow you because you're working like crazy. And you yeah, you're trying have to be, a legit. You got a legitimate you, excuse. To, I mean, so then there shouldn't be a such thing as a control, as an overactive scorecard where you keep it up with all the things that I didn't do. Because let's tell well, the truth. So, you know, while you're concerned uh, about, wait a minute, wait a minute, while you're concerned about me not painting the garage, what about the days that I come in from work and you haven't done the dishes or you haven't washed clothes or when I come now, in see, and you haven't dealt with things like that? This is, this is where you are going tit for tat. And go, doing that doesn't make the relationship any better, any stronger, more clear. It doesn't do any of that. It just clouds the, the, the conversation. And it clouds the communication. Now, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to have days when you're going to get the laundry done, you're going to get everything done, and then you have six, seven days in a row like that. Then all of a sudden you have a solid week where you can barely get anything done. Throw all that stuff in the trash because give her your word. Now, you said something. You said something. If you told her, uh, gave her your word that you're going to do this thing, my brother – Go ahead and do it. And if you're at work or your schedule won't allow you to get to it, then you got to say to her or to him, look, I know I said I was going to paint the garage. I haven't been able to get the time to do it and let her know why. Share the reasons with her, you know, and just offer a peace offerings, meaning uh, we could try again tomorrow. Well, well, we had a here is a reality that when you have an overactive scorecard like this, and you said something, you said it becomes a matter of tick to tat. What it really becomes is the person who's trying to come out on top, the person who's yeah, trying to be in control, the person who is trying to be in control. And this is the thing, this is why there are complications now in marriage. Because someone is always trying to be in control of the other. That someone is trying to be the one who calls the shots. When I say jump, you say how high. Make it a person so nervous that, you know, they're concerned about anything that they do or anything that they say because of the response it may trigger. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you see, you're, you're, you're painting another scenario, you're painting other pictures, but when you take away all the hoopla, when you remove all the smoke, when you put it, when you go where the rubber meets the road, the truth of the matter is you may want to be in control, but you're more upset with yourself because you lost control. <clears throat> all right. Uh, huh. Say that again. Somebody needs to hear that. Well, I'm just saying, you find yourself in a position where you want to be it. You lost control. You want to be in control. And sometimes it, it just doesn't work. I mean, the truth of the matter is, sweet, sir, ma'am, whoever you are, your job is not to, to, to dominate another man or another woman. Your job is to have dominion over your situations and over the circumstances to which God is allowing you to work through. Now, know the difference between dominion and domination. Dominion means rulership, 
uh, uh, and you're walking in an authority of loving kindness and tender mercies. Domination means you're going to do it my way or it's the highway. So uh, let me just ask this question. So are you, are you saying that you cannot be in control by losing control? You won't be in control if you lose control. <laughs> and you don't need to be in control because now you're putting pressure on that individual. You, they are not a, hey, look, they are not a seal or a penguin or some animal that you train, okay? And we know what the scripture says. You put bits in a horse's mouth to turn that horse whichever way you want to. We're not dealing with horses here. We're not dealing with bits and things of that nature. What we're dealing with is a real person that has feelings, that cries like you do, that hurts like you do, that expresses their concern like you do. Now, my question to that person is, are you really, uh, really, uh, do you find it necessary to stretch your stuff in that fashion so that your partner or your your wife, your husband, or whatever you want to call him, can be made to look bad because people don't understand. Whatever habits you have at home in private will eventually make their way to the surface in public, you know? Okay. 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 So, so I mean, whatever real you do Uh-huh. These are some real issues. Matters. These are some real issues. What about let's 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 go here. Let's go here. What about guilt trip? Everything you gotta do this, you gotta play this guilt trip just to get your way. Well, that's about selfishness. Mm-hmm. That's selfishness. <laughs> you, you, you Can you give me an example of a guilt trip? <laughs> well, you know, uh, just, just uh, here's a here's a good one. What, what uh, overseer just said? You said you was gonna paint the garage three months ago, and you didn't paint it. And I just don't understand why you won't do what you say you're gonna do. Because you always say you're gonna do something, and you don't ever say you don't know, you don't ever do what you say you're gonna do it. And I just don't understand it. And I don't even know if I can trust you now because you you just didn't do what you said. You 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 promised. No, you know what it is. Bowser, you didn't finish that. So you know, so, if you're talking about the guilt trip, you got to finish that scenario with. If you really loved me, you would have did it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Come on. That, that's, where, that's where they try to play the guilt trip. They start uh, throwing that love uh, out there. If you, if you really love me like you say you do, I, I wouldn't even have to ask for me. I, I wouldn't even have to bring it up. You just would have did it. Well, it's too bad it ain't done. It's going to get done another day. <laughs> uh, that's and really, and really, these, these, lies, these lies come from a subject that, that was thrown out there. That's when you start getting into not control. That's when you start getting into the ignorance of marriage. <laughs> That, that's, really what talking, that's really what we're talking about now, the ignorance of marriage. With, with these, things, these things that we're discussing now, it's just pure, it's just pure ignorance. Because if, if your husband is working 40 hours, the daggone garage ain't going to change unless you get out there and start, it, and start the trimming. And then he come home and do a little bit. You go back and do a little bit, you know. But if you, if this man can work uh, uh, 50 hours, 60 hours that week, that garage ain't get paid that week. Because if he is off on Saturday, guess where he at? In the bed. Mm, mm-hmm. Trying to get some sleep. All right. Because if he don't work, 
if he's in the bed. Huh? If he's in the bed, he's got to be a weak man. No, 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 no. If he in the bed, he a smart man, or he be a dead man. <laughs> but you got to understand, unfortunately, there are women who do not care. I'm telling you, some years ago, my friend worked in Savannah, Georgia. He worked on the port. He worked, he worked every single day that he was allowed to work. Came home, and, the, you know, then the wife wanted, to, wanted him to take his son to football. Right? Come home from that, the wife wanted him to cut the grass. This man died at the age of 40. Died at the mm. age of 40. And you know the wife, she, she, got she got all the insurance money and blew it on someone else. You don't hear mm. what I'm saying. I yeah, I do. Because all she was wear himself out. If you love me, you'll do it. That's okay. Is that what you just said? If you love me, you'll do it. And, and, and really, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. That, and that's why, that's why, even from the beginning of the relationship, uh, start. That's why the Lord says, "I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give this man a help, a help me." Any woman mm-hmm. sitting around waiting for her husband to do everything, you don't plan to have them long. Okay. Wow. Wow. He can't do the. He can't go to work. Be the plumber. Be the electrician. Be be the lawn. Be, be the landscape keeper. And all this, and you plan for him to stay around long. Now it's different okay. if, if, if you get a guy that feels like he got to be all. Now that's on him. But when you mm-hmm. push it, he, he got to get this done. He got to do this. He got to do that. I, I, matter of fact, now that I think about it, there's a friend of mine. If his wife, if his wife get him up five o'clock in the morning, honey, I, I, I think I think I hear a picture. Five o'clock in the morning, he in there trying to see if the if the job is loose or whatever. But if, if that would mean five o'clock in the morning, it gonna drip till I get up. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to fix those things five o'clock in the morning. And mm-hmm. she knows he'll do it. So there's been several days. When she woke him up early or extra early, let me put it like that. <laughs> or over menial, over menial things that could be done later mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. My God. Mm-hmm. There is so much. There is so much in all of this. Dr. Kimmy, I haven't heard from you. I need you to talk to me a little bit here. Come on, Dr. Kimmy. Sure. What do you need? What do you need? You, you've been hearing all of these different things. You've been hearing all these different things. Have you ever experienced guilt trips or the, the overactive scorecard or any of those things that we've been talking about? I know you've been listening. Can you talk to us about oh, anything absolutely. that you know? And, and, and give us some signs of what we should be looking for when we see when these things are appearing. Oh, I remember one time I uh, cleaned the entire house. It was uh, beautiful. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I yes. remember I cleaned the entire house, and uh, at that time I was married, and it was nice, and everything was well done, but guess what? In the corner there was um, – a little uh, cotton ball that he recognized. Oh, the house was good, but you forgot that one. <laughs> you know how those little lint that you sometimes may overlook when you're sweeping? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would never forget that. It's like, But this person was on their computer all this time, and that's the only thing he saw. He didn't say, good, well job done, or 
you know, the house was beautiful. He always tried to find something to um, nitpick. So uh, when that happens, that is, that is a person that can never be satisfied. And when you deal with um, a person who can never be satisfied, it is up to you to decide if this is the type of lifestyle that you can live for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. It's real. Life is, you only got one yeah. life to live. And I know that God didn't give you one life to live to live like this. So, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So nitpicking to me is another sign of control because it's always something. No matter what you do, it's always something. It's never a thank you for giving this house. You know, it's something that you're always looking to uh, retain. Okay. Okay. Uh, G. Johnson, out of all of these things, yes. can you tell us your experience and signs we should look for? Have I experienced any of those things like nitpicking and and uh, yeah? What's, what's some of the other things? Yeah. Um, I can't remember an incident like that. To be honest with you, you know. Uh, now I I don't think I've gone through any of that. Nitpicking so you've had a perfect marriage. I'm sorry. So you, you've had a perfect. So you've had a perfect marriage. No, I didn't say that, but I didn't go through nitpicking and stuff like that. Mm-mm. It might have been something else, but it wasn't that. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Overseer. Overseer, you still here? Okay, I guess he disappeared on us. What about you, Apostle? What what was that? What was your question again? Out of all the things that we talked about tonight, have you gone through any of these things, and what were the signs? What should we be looking for? Uh, I've been through two or three of them, the thing is, I really can't tell you a sign because, oh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. It is one sign uh, you need to look out for. Can we talk for a minute? <laughs> you, got to always, okay. you, got to, you got to always be leery about that. And find out which way it's going because it may start off like it's going to be something good, but before it's over, you say, Why did I even pay attention to this? Mm-hmm. So you okay. you have to watch what they say. Can we, can we talk? And I'm talking about either male or female. Can we talk for a minute? You better find out which way that thing is going quick. Before you be trapped up in something that you don't even know how you got there. Okay. 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 Oh, my. Well, I can tell you now, out of all of these things, I have really dealt with uh, overt threats. Uh, I can tell you from experience that, um, but that, that I dealt with a situation where, um, I was paying the car note, and I was told, you know, that uh, I'm going to report the car stolen. <laughs> it's my car. It's my car. And I, one point, and I got to the point where I said, well, if it's your car, well, then let me give you your keys, and let me let you have the payment. <laughs> I'm not going to be bothered with you. Because, because when you get back, it's no longer mine. It's ours. It's that simple. There are some other things that we're going to deal with on next week. We're not out of this subject. We're just out of time for tonight. And I thank you for joining us here on Making Marriage Meaningful. I want to leave you with this thought. Your marriage will always be meaningless until your mate becomes meaningful. Right until next week, join us right here on Making Marriage Meaningful on Elation Radio 
10 o'clock Eastern, uh, 9 Central. I promise you, you're going to hear something that's going to help you. Again, we welcome your comments. We welcome your thoughts, your questions. If there's something you would like for us to talk about pertaining to the marital relationship, do not hesitate to inbox us at Making Marriage Meaningful. Do not hesitate to send us your questions um, or, or your thoughts or your concerns, and we will definitely address them with the help of the Lord. Thank you, Apostle Smith. Thank you, Overseer Richard. Thank you, G. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Kenny Kim. We bless you. We love you. We say go with God, and he will, and he will go with you. Kenny Kim, kick that track, why don't you? We say shalom, shalom. Oh. 